Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the noted Colombian author, won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1982 for a body of work that included the renowned Cien Años de Soledad, 100 Years of Solitude. Winning the Nobel Prize in Literature is something that Bob Dylan now shares with Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Garcia Marquez wrote in a literary style referred to as magical realism, revealing the magical in the world, in which the supernatural realm blends with the natural, familiar world. In 1985, he published perhaps his greatest work, Love in the Time of Cholera, Amor en el Tiempo de Cholera. This work said, in 1880 in a mythical Latin American town, told the story of two people who after long lives without love, finally found love in their 70s, even while death and despair was all around them. Cholera has two meanings in Spanish. It refers to the disease that was a pandemic at that time and prior in our world history. It refers also to anger or rage. And certainly, cholera caused anger and rage. It destabilized the society of that day. It brought unsettling times, social upheaval, a waterborne disease. It came upon a person suddenly. You could be at a party in the early afternoon and dead that evening. So in the novel, Garcia Marquez asks, how do we find love in the time of cholera, a time when disease and despair were paramount? Cholera is not simply a disease of the last century that's now been completely eradicated. It pops up from time to time in our modern era. We saw cholera break out in Haiti after the earthquake in the recent hurricane. We've seen cholera continue to devastate developing communities. Cholera is a disease that brings a sense of dis-ease. We are now at a time of dis-ease because of the heightened rhetoric and the contentiousness in our national discourse, as well as in our work in education. So with apologies to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, I ask the question with you today, how do we educate in this time of cholera? And is there a future for our democratic society? How do we find love, civility, colleagueship in the midst of our version of this epidemic of dis-ease that we're living in? We've recently concluded a presidential election, and I'd like to offer some reflections on the context of education against the backdrop of what we're experiencing in this country. And I do believe that despite this heightened rhetoric that we're seeing throughout this cycle, that education is the pathway for the future of our democracy. As Professor Danielle Allen of Harvard University stated recently, in this election, there were large numbers of undereducated people who sought release from the trap of diminished opportunities and felt no one was listening to them. Sadly, their aspirations got wretchedly intertwined with the racist, xenophobic, homophobic, and sexist agendas and beliefs that the David Dukes among us and their amplifiers in ways that are demeaning and disrespectful. This has been an acrimonious national conversation. And it causes all of us to ask, what is the role of education in our democratic society? So let's look at the roots of education in this country. The United States did not always support free public education for all. Public schooling came out of the common school movement, and it was a long, hard-fought battle. 
the fledgling United States as a new country framed a set of ideals. We haven't always lived up to those ideals. But those ideals stood in contrast to Europe, where social mobility was closed and fixed and was primarily based on the accident of birth and the class that one was born into. The United States was conceived of as a democratic nation where all people were afforded equal access to social mobility. Of course, the truth was, all did not mean all. But the big idea was that social mobility, unlike the more aristocratic Europe, was more open, and therefore, democracy required that all people living in this country, regardless of their birth, their background, their parents' backgrounds, would have the same opportunity to advance and succeed by going to an excellent free public school. Jonathan Kozel, in his works such as Savage and Equalities, reminds us both of the eloquence of these American ideals and our lack of living up to them throughout our history and in education today. Historically, people came to the United States through slavery, conquest, colonization, or immigration. The American ethos was framed as a land of opportunity, most especially for the waves of immigrants who came to these shores. Public education served the new immigrant communities that came to America. And the rationale for providing public education for all was to create an educated citizenry that would be able to fully participate in the functions of democracy. And of course, to also serve the functions of the workplace in the era of the Industrial Revolution. It also sought to Americanize the new waves of immigrants. But from the beginning, there were holes in the fabric. Not everyone had equal rights to public education. The common school wasn't so common, or at least it wasn't common for everyone. As we solidified what we wished our country to be as a democracy, and we did this through legislation, court cases, through struggle, through advocacy, through social movements. In terms of education, one landmark case was Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. This action by the Supreme Court ended segregation in public schools. But as we think this through, this was 1954. Almost 70 years later, we are still aware of the savage inequalities in public education and public schools and the differences in funding and the ways that schools continue to be segregated by race and class, by geography, by immigration and legal status. So Brown versus the Board of Education began a process leading to desegregation but this was in no way like flipping a light switch. It's proved difficult. It's proved painful. Equity and access to education is a value of our nation's public education system, but integration and equality has not always been embraced by all, and we still see these tensions today. Throughout the history of this country, we've been told that anyone can become successful, with hard work, great ideas, and a good deal of merit. This is the ethos of the American dream. And we tell stories of American pioneers like Andrew Carnegie, John Rockefeller, Henry Ford, and even modern icons, people like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Ellen Musk, Oprah Winfrey. Our contemporary sport figures like Kobe Bryant and entertainers and successful business people like Madonna. But these are one-off stories focusing on unsettling social patterns in our society. In the United States, we may love the rags to riches stories, but the truth is they exist in contrast to the American dream myth and there are clear systemic barriers and opportunity gaps for many individuals and groups, including those who are Muslim, black, 
Latino, Asian, gay, immigrants, people with disabilities, and women. Gender inequality continues to manifest itself in multiple ways in American society, in our workplaces, in pay and equity. A recent study revealed that women are paid close to 80 cents for every dollar earned by men, a gender wage gap of 20%. These issues also manifest themselves in systemic and institutional racism. These aren't simply things that happened long ago in our history. They're things we live with today. In a country as wealthy as the United States, the reality of homelessness and poverty is a scandal that exists in our midst. I am pleased to see some hope as a local community we're addressing homelessness in our Los Angeles region with the passage of LA City Measure HHH. Recently, the Jesuit works in Los Angeles, the coming together of all of the Jesuit institutions, Loyola Marymount University, Loyola High, Verbum Dei, Dolores Mission, Blessed Sacrament, the other institutions, came together in support of the homeless with a mass, which was organized by Yolanda Brown of Blessed Sacrament, who's here with us today. Poverty affects everyone, men, family, children. It particularly affects women who are especially vulnerable to sexual assault and violence. And violence is yet another manifestation of the obstacles and barriers that fill our society. There's been so many shootings in schools, in theaters, in public places. This year, one of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history occurred at the Orlando nightclub, which targeted gay Latino youth. Where a night of socializing and being with friends turned into tragedy and unspeakable grief. A night that touched the heart of all America. Violence in our cities has manifested itself in so many ways. In relationships with our law enforcement and our communities. In protests such as this one in Ferguson after Michael Brown was killed. And violence has led to fatal shootings of police officers, in this case, two who were shot in Palm Springs, California. This is a photo of Little Rock in 1957, the desegregation of Central High School. This is what racism and segregation looked like then. Let's look at how some of these issues influence schools and education today. Prejudice and discrimination continues in our society in ways that are often more implicit than in the past. We talk about implicit bias, microaggressions, stereotype threat, the need for trigger warnings, concerns about profiling and stereotyping based on ethnicity, gender, and other identity markers. In terms of education, we're very concerned about the school-to-prison pipeline, where schools, which should be a place for learning and ideas, become a breeding ground for future imprisonment, particularly for our youth of color. Nearly 3,000 children in the United States have been sentenced to die in prison through life without parole sentences, including youth as young as 13 and 14 years old. And more than 70% of the youngest children who are incarcerated are African-American or Latino. Today's youth already have so many challenges with struggling through adolescence, with gangs, with drugs. And yet for many, they are on the bus, which leads them from school to prison. And we know in education, in terms of the self-fulfilling prophecy, that if we treat our youth as juvenile delinquents, they will end up that way. We're concerned about the mental health, the physical health, and the total well-being of our youth. Too many children experiencing bullying and cyberbullying at school. Children experience loneliness and depression. And there's such a stigma attached to mental illness. So often our youth do not get the help that they need. 
We struggle as a society to understand and to meet the needs of all students, including our youth with mental and physical disabilities. We must embrace the whole child and meet their mental and physical health needs. At the LMU School of Education, we do this through our counseling, school psychology, leadership, teacher education, special education programs, where we prepare educators who are competent and compassionate as professionals. We may like to think that these issues are all out there, but these issues exist on our own campus. This photo is particularly powerful and important to talk about because this wall is very symbolic. It depicts a wall that our students at LMU erected last spring to protest the divisive rhetoric in the campaign and to remind us that no human is illegal. And yet this wall was vandalized in our own community. In this immediate time after this election, we're living with uncertainty about what will happen on a range of issues. But one thing we know is that Loyola Marymount University stands with our immigrant communities and stands with our undocumented communities and those on the margins. There is no place at LMU for discrimination, racism, including those who are undocumented. So how do we talk about these difficult, challenging, contentious issues? I believe we need conversation around civility in our discourse. We need conversations in our society, in our classrooms, in our schools. We need to be able to talk to people who are different than us, who think differently than we do. There are a lot of indicators that tell us we have a great deal of work to do in terms of education. I'd like to show just a couple of slides that give us some snapshots of our current educational climate, and particularly as they relate to our work in the School of Education. So here I'm just picking one of the many slides that I could use to talk about test scores and opportunity and achievement gaps. So this shows the NAEP national scores for 12th grade math. And you can see differences among subgroups. Remember that the overall goal of the common school movement was to have excellent schools where everyone would have access to the same great, equal, free public education. And that education would become the great equalizer. We have too many indicators, however, telling us that this doesn't play out for everyone. If we look at the subgroups, we see that our Latinx students and our African American students test quite a bit behind our white and Asian Pacific Islander students. Now we know there are issues with high stakes standardized testing, but these scores remind us that we're not living up to the promise of great education that leads to equal access and opportunity. And when we look at who has bachelor's degrees in the United States, we also see gaps in attainment by socioeconomic levels. This chart shows degree attainment over time by family income. So what this shows is that in the top quartile of family income, 77% attained a bachelor's degree. And at the bottom fourth, only 9% attained a bachelor's degree. Economic background really does matter. And we know that educational success influences success in the workplace and success in life. Another contextual factor that we have to think about in our work in the School of Education is the change in the teacher preparation enrollment pipeline. Now, this is abbreviated from a full report which shows all 50 states. And we've just shown the bottom three and the top three but it's important to note that the three states on the right, the top three, are in fact the only states that showed positive growth. For all other states, it was negative. 
So California had the third highest decrease at 58%. Even though there was a slight increase in this past year, the first increase in 13 years, looking ahead to the large number of teachers who will retire, we see a continuing crisis in teacher education. And this shows us that we have fewer people motivated to go into the teaching profession in our PK-12 schools. So we have to ask ourselves, why does this generation of younger people look at the teaching profession and tell us in large numbers they're not interested? While we don't have hard data, we have a lot of anecdotal data and focus group data that tell us while there's a number of reasons. The primary reason is because they see teaching and education as a contentious environment and a profession that's not valued by society. They're not interested in stepping into such an acrimonious environment, especially with the pay that we give to our PK to 12 grade teachers. So let's think about this. If we don't have qualified teachers, the best and brightest, stepping in to teach our pre-K to 12th grade students, what will that pipeline be with as these young people come to the university, as they prepare themselves to function in an educated democracy, to be citizens, to make informed choices? Many have described the teacher shortage in California and throughout the country as a crisis as serious as our drought in California. So in many ways in our work in education, we find ourselves polarized and paralyzed. We have a dualistic and binary way of looking at the issues in education. This plays out in our state and it plays out in our Los Angeles region. And it manifests itself in so many different ways. This binary debate public school versus charter school, unionized versus non-unionized, private education versus public education, an adult agenda versus what's good for kids. And it's not just in Los Angeles or in California. This plays out nationally. And it's not so much that there are a range of opinions and issues and actually some very legitimate issues that we have to look at as a society and come to grips with and work out. It's more about the contentiousness of the debate. It's about the discourse. It's about the all or nothing approach, my way or the highway. And this contentious and often vitriolic discourse that we see in pre-K-12 education, it actually predates the contentious discourse we've had in the recent national election cycle. So those of us in the field of education, we have to take some responsibility and really think about our role in furthering this contentiousness. And in the meantime, who do we see falling through the cracks? It's most often our youth. So all of this I've talked about today, and it is a dark and deep picture. It brings me to ask the question, is there a future for our democratic society? As dean of the School of Education of LMU, this is an important question. But I don't hesitate at all. My answer is an absolute yes. Yes. Despite the difficult times we're living in, I do see reasons for hope. However, there are a lot of questions that we need to ask ourselves in this post-election period. Who holds the responsibility to help us move forward? If not our educational institutions, then who? If not at a Jesuit institution, then where? It's precisely because of who we are, our Jesuit and Marymount traditions, our history, our values, our commitment to our mission, that we hold the responsibility. Our Jesuit tradition provides us a privileged place of contemplation and action from which to move forward. So what is the way forward? We can learn from the history of how marginalized and oppressed communities 
have always moved forward in times of despair with resiliency that recognizes the power of relationships. We need to reject the binaries that usually frame the debate. And thus, I suggest to you that we need a third way where we embrace a new approach of looking at issues focused on inclusion and collaboration, one that includes listening to one another, one that includes listening to people who disagree with us, one that includes engaging in civil discourse. I believe our Jesuit approach to education serves as an antidote to this paralysis. Pope Francis, in his leadership role, not only as the leader of the Catholic Church, but as a world leader, helps to embody this as he points us to a new third way of being, a way of being with each other in relationship. Pope Francis is called for a culture of encounter. He believes that we all live in relationship. We come from others. We belong to others. In fact, our lives are enlarged by the encounter with the other. Everything we do is relational. We are all linked to those who have gone before us. The vision for us in the School of Education in preparing educators is to make this kind of impact in schools, in systems, in communities. The LMU School of Education strives to embody these ideals, which moves us forward in the Ignatian way toward a more inclusive and democratic society. As a school of education, we hold these values in our founding documents. Summarized here in this chart, in congruence with the LMU mission, our school of education mission and our conceptual framework in its seven tenets, which you see alongside uh, the circles, all point to the central point of our values which is summed up in our tagline, REAL, R-E-A-L. To respect, to educate, to advocate, and to lead. In this way, our mission affirms lifelong learning, affirms the care of the individual, affirms faith that leads us to do justice. And this is the heart of the Ignatian pedagogy paradigm. It's a commitment to inclusive excellence and continuous improvement as a professional learning community in support of our diverse students and the communities that we serve. We've been recognized for this approach and our work in inclusive education and diversity in several ways. On the left, this shows us receiving the AACTE Best Practice Award in Support of Multicultural Education and Diversity. So I'd like to put this in context for you. There's about 1,500 schools, colleges, departments of ed across the country. And the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education is the organization that brings them all together. I have to tell you, it was a privilege to have the LMU School of Education selected out of all 1,500 to receive the award for our outstanding commitment to multicultural education and diversity. And for me to receive that award on behalf of our faculty, staff, and students at the annual conference in front of 2,000 people. I also want to mention the awards that we've been recognized for by the National Catholic Education Association for our comprehensive approach to furthering the mission of Catholic education. We've been recognized through our rankings. U.S. News and World Report continues to identify us as one of the best graduate schools of education, ranking us number 62 nationally. We're the third highest ranked Jesuit institution in the United States, ahead of us only Boston College and Fordham. We're the third private independent institution in California, ahead of us only Stanford and USC. And we've also been recognized for our work by other organizations that rank our programs. Recently, diverse issues in higher education 
recognized Loyola Marymount University as the number 10 producer of Hispanic doctoral and professional degrees of all disciplines. Now this ranking is for the whole university and it's because of our doctorate in educational leadership for social justice and our Juris Doctorate at the law school. But it reminds us that we have an institutional commitment to diversity, to multicultural education, and to embracing the kinds of issues that I've talked about in the first part of this presentation. At the core of our impact is our faculty in the School of Education who contribute through teaching, scholarship, and service, and our part-time faculty who contribute as expert practitioners in the field. I'd like to highlight a few accomplishments of our faculty. And I want to say that I apologize for those I'm leaving out because our faculty is so productive. I could talk about each and every one. But a few special highlights. Martha McCarthy, who was the president's professor in educational leadership, last year was named an AERA fellow, which is incredibly prestigious. She also received AERA's Division A Excellent in Research Award. Elizabeth Riley, professor and chair in the Department of Educational Leadership, received the AERA Leadership for Social Justice Bridge People Award. Antonia Darder, the Levy President's Endowed Chair in Educational Leadership, received the 2016 Alpha Sigma Nu Book Award for the International Critical Pedagogy Reader. Now, those of us in the room who know that Alpha Sigma Nu is the National Jesuit Honor Society, we know how distinguished it is for a faculty member at our university to be selected as having the top book out of all 28 Jesuit universities and colleges in the United States. Paul DeSena was inducted into the California Association of School Counselors Emeritus Standing Committee for lifetime achievement and momentous contributions to the field of school counseling. Very much in line with our president's initiative on global imagination, we had two faculty receive Fulbrights this last year, Edmundo Litton in the Philippines and David Sapp in Colombia. And they joined Brian Learn as our recent faculty who have received Fulbrights. And our alumni have also made some great achievements in this area. Jacob Coronel, there uh, on, the, on the left, received his master's in secondary education and a Fulbright for research in Mexico, and Lauren Thurman, who as an undergraduate received her degree in liberal studies with a concentration in special education, and as a graduate student received her elementary teaching credential and her MA in educational studies, received a Fulbright for her work in Greece. Last year, we announced the inauguration of our SOE Alumni Association, led by Brian Johnson, a uh, double alum of Loyola Marymount, who's the board chair. In its second year, our alumni association did a day of service at the Emerson Avenue Community Garden, supporting Orville Wright Middle School and Wish Charter School. We've also had some success in fundraising and external resources. We exceeded our fundraising goal of $3.6 million for the fiscal year 2016 by raising 4.875 million, and that's fundraising. In terms of the external grants and contract expenditures, what we report to US News and World Report for our rankings, we had a terrific year. The education unit, which includes the School of Ed and any grants that other departments have related to PK-12 education, brought in, in this one year, just about 6.7 million and the School of Ed was 6.2. It was a terrific year for us in the School of Education, and I want to thank the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects, Associate Provost John Carfora and Cynthia Ruiz for their partnership with us. But I do have to step back and brag a little bit because you don't always have a year like this. 
So I want to talk about what these grant awards really mean for the School of Ed university-wide. This shows the grant awards in terms of the number of awards that were received by the faculty and staff in the School of Ed and the other schools and colleges. And you can see the School of Ed, in terms of numbers of external grants, really had a good year. But perhaps even more impressive is when we look at the total dollar amount that we see that the School of Ed last year brought in 62% of the grant awards that the whole university brought in. I think that's a remarkable accomplishment. <laughs> Partnerships are so critical to our grant success. I'd like to talk about the partnerships that we have, including the partnerships that we have with our centers. And many of you who are our valued partners are here today. Our Center for Equity for English Learners, which is celebrating a 10th anniversary, is led by Executive Director Magali Lavadens, and recently received a $2.7 million grant from the US Department of Education to partner with the Los Angeles Unified School District and the Sobrato Family Foundation to provide a comprehensive early literacy program for English learner students. I have to tell you, this is the largest single grant we have in the School of Ed at $2.7 million and the second largest grant that LMU as an institution has in its history. Congratulations to Dr. Lavalance. <laughs> And recently, this center uh, received the California Reading and Literature Project as part of its work led by Dr. Gina Chavez, who is a graduate of our doctoral program. Our LMU family of schools is celebrating a 10th anniversary under the leadership of Darren Early. This program connects the entire university with our local PK-12 schools. I'd like to acknowledge the founding director, Drew Ferretti, who's here today, who's now the president and CEO of Para Los Niños, along with Darren Early. Thank you and congratulations to you both. <laughs> I'd like to talk about our Center for Catholic Education and its, the number of programs under its work. The center is led by uh, Executive Director Father Robert Walsh and has a long history of partnering with our Catholic schools in Los Angeles, and now through our Place Core program, we're in the Diocese of Orange and the Diocese of San Bernardino. I especially want to thank those who have provided scholarship and support over the years, the William H. Hannon Foundation. Uh, Jim Hannon is here with us today. The Catholic Education Foundation, Kathy Ash is with us here today. This is a photo from last year's commissioning mass, and you see uh, the dual wheelchairs in the front. That's our our beloved Father Copus, Dean Emeritus in the School of Education, and we're so pleased that his recovery continues to come along very well. And next to him is Anita Finney, uh, who was acknowledged for her contributions in supporting the PLACE program. And I want to point out that along with our president and the PLACERs, on the far right is Diana Murphy, the founding director of the PLACE program and who led it for 16 years. You know, Diana is the one that really gave birth to this program, which is such an anchor program for all of our work in the School of Ed, particularly with Catholic schools. I'd like to acknowledge her for 16 years of great service. And I'd like to recognize our interim leadership, Mary Frazier and Sister Claudette DeForge. Our great partnerships, Dr. Kevin Baxter is here with us, uh, superintendent of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and Dr. Austin Conley from the Diocese of San Bernardino. Our Center for Math and Science Teaching, along with our STEM work, and program director Michael Castiglione leads professional development in public and Catholic schools. We especially do this through our CMAS Triangle of Schools, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Catholic Schools Collaborative and Ellen Holton, the executive director, who's here with us today. As part of our work in the STEM area and our work at our local schools, we've developed two demonstration school partnerships. 
Director Philip Molbash leads the center's work at Playa Vista Elementary, the school right down the hill. And I want to acknowledge Rebecca Johnson, the principal who's here with us today, and also our most recent demonstration school partnership, Wish Charter, a fully inclusion school located here on the west side. And several of our faculty uh, serve on the Wish board, most notably Irene Oliver, Vicki Graff, along with Manny Aceves. These partnerships are a team effort in the School of Education. I'm really grateful to our faculty and staff that make this happen. In particular, though, I want to recognize the associate dean who leads our work in these partnerships, Dr. Manny Aceves, and thank him for the many years of leading these amazing partnerships. Our mathematics leadership core, under, under the directorship of Kathy Klimmer, is a unique partnership between LMU and philanthropy. One of our major partners is the Coatsen Foundation for the Art of Teaching, and we partnered with them along with the Leonetti O'Connell Family Foundation and the Lewis L. Boric Foundation. This initiative began in the Culver City Unified, where it has seen great success, and recently has expanded into the El Segundo Unified School District and the Wiseburn School District, along with the Da Vinci Charter Schools. I want to recognize and thank two of the leaders in those areas who are here with us today, Dr. Melissa Moore, the superintendent of El Segundo Unified, and Dr. Tom Johnstone, the superintendent of Wiseburn Unified. Thank you for your belief in us and your partnership. One of our newest initiatives is the IDEAL Institute, which is the Institute for Digital Education and Leadership under the direction of Shannon Tobaldo. This focuses on a number of things, including blended learning initiatives in Catholic schools, as well as technology integration and blended learning certificates for teachers and administrators. I'm especially grateful to our funders for supporting this work including the Specialty Family Foundation, and Deb Estes and Joe Walmack are here today, the Shea Family Charities, and the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. Thank you to our benefactors for helping us launch this work. <laughs> the Center for Undergraduate Teacher Preparation is a university-wide initiative which is housed in the School of Education which focuses on building the undergraduate teacher preparation pathway. It's led by Dr. Annette Hernandez. And if you reflect on what I said earlier about this teacher shortage, getting our undergraduates to begin thinking about careers in teaching is so important. And it's a kind of thing that the Center for Undergraduate Teacher Preparation supports. Likewise, our LMU Upward Bound Program, which is a university initiative but now housed in the School of Education, helps build the bridge between high school and college for students of color. It's led by Norma Romero and Aaron Beasley. And we're so happy to tell you that the first Upward Bound graduate of this program has now graduated from LMU in spring 2016, Carlos Cruz. So it just tells us this program actually works. I want to spend some time talking about one of our most important partnerships in the School of Education, our partnerships with Teach for America across California. In the last few years, Teach for America has made a concerted effort to have a core that is diverse, including significant numbers of teachers of color, first-generation college graduates, teachers from low-income backgrounds, teachers who are DACA students themselves. TFA has purposely worked to ensure that core members in Los Angeles and in the Bay Area and in Sacramento reflect the communities in which they serve. On the LMU side, this partnership is led by Dr. Edmundo Litton. Uh, it's a statewide partnership in Los Angeles as well as in Northern California. In Northern California, it includes Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose, and Sacramento, where we have about 300 core members in the Bay Area and 50 in the Sacramento Capital Valley. I'd especially like to recognize two people who are here from Northern California, our terrific partners, the executive director of TFA Bay Area, Paul Keyes, and the managing director, Rebecca Blackall. 
I'd like to recognize them along with Executive Director of Teach for America LA, Lyda Jennings. Let's thank them for being here. We continue to grow and develop in our international partnerships, and the School of Ed is a leader in global imagination. We're doing this in a number of ways, and in the last few years, we've launched several study abroad courses in the Philippines in a partnership with Teach for the Philippines led by Edmundo Litton. In Ecuador, a study abroad program most recently led by Beth Stoddard and Emily Fisher, and previous faculty include Brian Learn and Bill Parham and the International Colloquium on Languages, Cultures, Identity, and Schools, and Society in Soria, Spain, led by Francisco Ramos. One of our newest programs is our program in higher education, led by Beth Stoddard, which helps prepare the next generation of leaders for colleges and universities. And our doctoral program in educational leadership for social justice, led by Dr. Jill Bickett and Dr. Carrie Huckting, continues to be distinctive, graduating distinguished alumni, some who are with us today, including Dr. Tommy Chang, the superintendent of Boston Public Schools, who came all the way from Boston to be with us, and other distinguished alumni. Uh, Tommy, we know you're doing great work. You make us so proud that one of our graduates is leading the fourth largest public school system in the United States. Congratulations. <laughs> And finally, I want to mention uh, that we're in year two of our Better Together California Teachers Summit partnership, a statewide initiative that brings together a diverse range of educators to learn from one another and to celebrate the education profession. LMU plays a leadership role within the AICCU network, the Association of the Independent and Private Schools in California. This was hosted at 38 sites across California in partnership with the CSU system and the New Teacher Center. And there in the middle, you see uh, Los Angeles Unified Superintendent Michelle King, who attended the LMU site to give the opening welcoming. And LMU, as I mentioned, was the recipient of a $2 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, along with other funders to help implement this Better Together program. I want to recognize one of our partners who's here today with Teach Plus, Mike Stryer. This is just a terrific event for all of California. Thank you to everyone that's part of it. The work of our whole faculty, our full-time and our part-time faculty is so important, along with the work of our staff. We have an amazing faculty, an amazing staff, and what they do every day in support of our students, our programs, our partnerships, we couldn't do this work without them. So in conclusion today, I've talked about a range of issues. I've talked about some difficult and challenging issues, but I believe that in these times, we need to talk about these issues. I've also talked about some of our successes in the School of Education and ways that we as a faculty, as staff, as students, are seeking to make a difference. But it leads us in conclusion to think about how do we find education and love in this time of dis-ease? What's the response to these issues? The answer is education. Now certainly there was some good news in California last week because California voted positively on all three education initiatives to fund education, to restore bilingual education, there is some hope in our midst. But the answer is a certain type of education. It's a type of education that resonates with who we are, with our deep spiritual roots as a Jesuit and Marymount institution. This is particularly powerful for our work as a school of education. As a dean, I think about what will our legacy be? And the answer is in the stories and the living impact of our students and our alumni. At the LMU School of Ed, we have almost 9,000 alumni who are making a difference every day in the field. It's our alumni who are influenced by our Jesuit and Marymount values, who then serve in communities and make a difference because of the framework that they bring with them. I want to close, I mean, I could talk about 
all of our alumni. I would love to tell you the story of all 9,000 alumni. But today, I'm going to just close and tell you the story of one particular alum because I believe his story is representative of the kinds of graduates that we're putting out in the field. And his story represents the collective impact. This young man is Laron Armstead, and he represents, I think, the very best of what we are and what we do at Loyola Marymount University. There's no one better than to tell you his story than himself, so I'd like you to watch just a very brief video. I'm Leron Armstead. I was born and raised in the projects in South Central Los Angeles. We look up to our elders, and my oldest brother, he was in the gang, so that's the guy I looked up to. Either the street's gonna test you, or they're gonna put you in a situation where you can lose your life. He can really help a lot of these kids, because once he tell them his story, they're gonna believe in him. I believe what saved me was the Salvation Army Youth Center. LeBron wanted to be a better basketball player, so I taught him how to be a better basketball player, a better person. He gave me salvation. Basketball was a tool for me to go further in life especially further in my education. When LeRon got accepted to LMU, it was like a dream come true. We were all excited, especially my sister. My mom passed away during my season. It was like losing everything I had. You know, around the street element, when you lose like your mother, your grandmother, some people that make them worse to where they don't care about nothing, just feel like they can't live anymore. I didn't know what to do, but just keep on going. When she passed away, I played the next game. And I arranged everything for the funeral. It molded character in me because I didn't run from this challenge that I was faced with. I'm now in a master's program at Loyola Marymount University, helping out on the men's basketball team. I'm assistant coaching at St. Mark's Middle School. I'm also creating programs at LMU called Athletes for Athletes, where I help athletes with their professionalism skills. A big reason for why I work so hard is so that I can help my family get out of the neighborhood that they're in. They push me without them even knowing it to be better in life. You can help somebody be a better person, you know, and I make other people feel good about them being a better person. The big picture for the Ron is to help everyone and be happy in life. I'm LeRon Armstead and I live with fire. So that short video done by Reebok helps to tell his story. Um, Laurent talked about being a master's student. He's now a graduate of our master's program in counseling. Uh, he was hired at Southwest Community College where he did his internship to be a community counselor, to help uh, talk and work with young people from his own community who in fact don't understand the options that they have and to further their education. There you see Laron at the bottom left graduating with his master's. That was former President Dave Burcham greeting him. On the right you see him. He was a panelist last year at our White House Initiative for Educational Excellence for African Americans. Uh, another picture of graduation on the top right. And in the center, that's a photo because Laron was recently recognized by the LMU CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice as a hidden hero on our campus. Laurent is someone who truly lives the Ignatian vision and the mission of being a person for and with others. He's the kind of person that doesn't seek recognition. He's a hidden hero because he doesn't call attention to himself. He does this work because of who he is and because of the influence and impact of LMU. Laurent is not simply a hidden hero but a gentle giant. His life has been transformed by LMU, both as an undergrad and a graduate, and now he seeks to transform other lives in the way he does his work. Laurent is with us today, and I'd like you, Laurent, to come up and be recognized. <laughs> Laurent, you, rep you represent the best of who we are. I've been so proud to know you, to be one of your teachers, a mentor, and a friend. Uh, you stand today in place of so many of our alumni.
who are making an impact. So I stand here with Laurent and I say, how do we find love? How do we educate in a time of cholera and disease? And it's people like Laron that give me the faith and the hope that what we do on this hill really makes a difference. And from this place, we can influence our city, our region, our state, and our country. I want to thank all of you for coming today to listening. And I invite each one of you as you go out to think about how you can make the difference and to join us in the School of Education in being and forming a new generation of leaders. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.